Brought to you by the Rugby Outlet Mall. Equipping you for freedom and connection through rugby. Find out more at RugbyOutletMall.com. Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Time at Bailu, and this is the podcast where we speak with people about the opportunities they found, created, taken advantage of, or have used that via rugby. And we have another great guest today, Pat Evans of Front Office Sports. Now, if you've never heard of Front Office Sports, this is an actual sports business uh Blo- I don't want to say blog. It's a sports business media platform where essentially they just track everything that's going on from TV ratings to what's happening in tech, what's happening in uh, sports engagement, just everything sports and sports business related that's off the field, basically. And uh, Pat had been a regular content creator for content creator for stuff about Major League Rugby, particularly when they were doing their Vegas tournament, and I really wanted to bring him on because of the fact that I I wanted to get another interesting take into rugby, into the business of sports, and uh, just kind of see what the outside range coming in, in another perspective of how to utilize and look at rugby outside of our community itself. Uh, for me, this was a really fun podcast. I think we laughed a lot. We, we we had a lot of fun with this one. So I think you guys will enjoy listening to this one. It's not the most rugby focused, but there are a lot. There's elements in there that I think can be used for your own personal rugby brands, whether it's club or or personal. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Hope you guys take something from it. Also, I want to thank everybody who has taken the time to put reviews on the Apple iTunes uh, podcast. And uh, and please, guys, continue. We didn't quite make our goal of 10. I, I got to say, that one hurt a little bit. But, you know, if you guys can try and let's see if we can aim for that again for the end of the month. Really, actually, to be honest with you, we up it up. So aim for 15. Going to aim for 15 by the end of the month. We've got to make up for what was lost uh, previously. But it's not just to be able to stroke my own ego. It allows this podcast to be found uh, by more people in random places. It pushes it up with the algorithm. And, of course, it allows others to be able to see the support and see what you guys feel and allow them to be able to listen to this and be able to take something from it. Hopefully, value has been taken from this as well, from our all our, our podcast interviews with these great guests and what we even have coming up uh, for the rest of the month. So, I, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys are having a great new August. Um, you know, almost the end of summertime, and it, it's wild. It still doesn't feel like n- much has changed in terms of what we're able to do, and it looks like it's going to be interesting about the fall sports. It doesn't look like it's going to be happening for most of the universities, but there is good news that World Rugby allowed for October uh, test matches to occur. So for what it's worth, while there might not be as much grassroots rugby happening, it looks like at the elite levels of rugby we'll still be able to have it, and that means there's still always competition and hope for what happens in the spring and moving forward. Um, yeah, you know. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I want to leave you guys with uh, uh, another sponsorship. Guys, please go check out Rugby Outlet Mall. We got some great shirts coming up soon. We have some new projects that are coming up soon. But most importantly, we got some great movies that are be, are available through our links and uh, uh, that I think you guys would really enjoy. Uh, obviously, you guys can go check them out through there. Uh, you guys can use promo code GROWRUGBY for 20% off all Rugby Outlet Mall exclusive gear. And the reason why it's always important that it to be able to get this gear is we're forming community, not just simply within the rugby pitch, but outside of it. We want to normalize rugby as a lifestyle, both for us and in the mainstream. And this helps us to be able to move forward, of course, being able to provide opportunities. And we're looking to be able to provide opportunities for other people within this industry because rugby as an industry is rugby as a lifestyle, is rugby on the pitch, is rugby as an identity. So it's it's going to be really – it's really good, really helpful for it. So don't forget Grow Rugby uh, for 20% off all rugby outlet gear. That's G-R-E-A-U-X Rugby, two words, promo code. Also, please check out Singapore to Tokyo any way we can. 
the documentary. It's the one that we made. It's our little ode to rugby. We've had some great reviews from people like Alex Goff of Goff on Rugby, Naya Tapper, who we even had on the podcast. Uh, um, we've had it from Matt McCarthy of Rugby Wrap Up. Uh, we've had some great interview, great reviews from uh, just a number of people who have been able to watch and enjoy it. And you guys can actually get it at redearthfilms.vhx.tv. That's redearthfilms.vhx.tv. Or you guys can go on to Rugby Outlet Mall and look under movies and TV shows, and it's going to be right there. Singapore to Tokyo any way we can. It's just, I'm telling you, it'll be the best thing that you've watched since COVID and definitely one of the top rugby documentaries out uh, today. It's just, it's such a, a wide view and especially from such a personal look through this, this rugby world, literal rugby world that we have. But in the meantime, guys, I hope you guys enjoy this interview. My guy, Pat Evans. Front office sports. Check it out. Welcome, everybody, to another great episode of Grow Rugby. We got another V, Eye of the Eyes, P guest, Pat Evans, writer for Front Office Sports. Beer aficionado, the author of two books, Grand Rapids Brewery and Nevada Brewery, Pat Evans. Pat, man, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, come through. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. I'm excited. This is, uh, you know, before, this little pre-chat was great, so I'm excited <laughs> for the actual podcast. <laughs> you know, it's, I have to tell you, this is going to be in completely dull, and uh, we're just going to be sitting here, no smiles. It is just the anti-rugby way. We, we, socialism, social, social, socializing is, is not a thing. It's not a thing, all right? <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take the smile off. <laughs> oh, no, man, look, I got to say, like, uh, the, the, actually, the, the first time I saw your stuff was actually whenever we were talking about uh, MLR going to Las Vegas. And, you know, I, I've been a big advocate of front office sports for a while because as much as I love sports in themselves in terms of the game, the business of sports is so much more intriguing to me because it's, I feel like so many people have a misconception of how it works. It's everybody seems to think it's a very, uh, ABC kind of thing. And sometimes it's like, yo, there's so much more gray in between here than, than people want to give it credit for. Yeah, I mean, so to to give you a little bit of my background right away, is it falls right into that, is going into college, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. I thought I wanted to be a sports journalist because who doesn't, you know. Doesn't, like, right. I, I'm just sports are great. Uh, and very quickly, you know, I ended up covering, I went to Michigan State, I ended up cover, covering Michigan State basketball my senior year, which was also Draymond Green's senior year, you know, great NBA nice, player. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, and I, you know, I traveled all over the country with them and very quickly I realized there's only so many things you can do with a game story, you know, like so-and-so had so many rebounds, so-and-so had, you know, four touchdowns. Four is a lot of touchdowns. You trying to do a lot of that story, but <laughs> well, look, look, I, it's how much, this whole little there was. It was like I just decided to make up stuff within the sport itself. Just <laughs> or, so, like, there's just a, how many times can you write? You know, the coach was mad at the team. The coach, you know, and and uh, you still see that. I, you know, I watch still watch a lot of like post game press conferences and stuff. Right. And athletes, not, you know, as as much as it stinks to say, a lot of them don't have the best uh, thoughts after games <laughs> or just speak in cliches, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so then, you know, I, I left and ended up going into regular business journalism back in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I'm from. And, uh, eventually I went freelance and went mostly to beverage, uh, food and beverage, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. and then, uh, found front office sports and started freelancing for them a little bit before and now I'm full-time, uh, staff writer. Uh, but business and sports business in particular, it's it's always changing. Unlike what's on the field, which is action packed and great, right. but it's always you're writing about what's happening on the field, which there's only so many things that can happen on the field. Off the field, there's so much innovation always going on, whether it's tech or fan engagement, fan, you know, whatever. 
And so there's always something new to write about, a new angle to take it, especially when you look at the last four months of the pandemic. Right. When there's no sports on the field, think about how many things are needing to get done on the business side. Exactly. Of exactly. how to drive revenue, how to keep fans engaged without their beloved sports, how, to, how much money they're losing because they can't have fans and all this stuff. And it's just like, if I was writing about sports on the field, there was literally nothing to write about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was, uh, there was the memory of that. Was basically right, I'd be, the I'd be writing think story. pieces of, you know, <laughs> why Mike Trout's going to be the greatest baseball player in history, which, you know, that, you can write about that, but... It's, at some point, like, it, again, all it is is just conjecture at some point, at, at, at a point. It's just like, exactly. you, you don't have much. And to be honest with you, I actually came across it in the same way with rugby. So whenever I started, initially mine was always, hey, let's talk about what's going to happen on the field. Let's break it down. Let's really give people the information as it was. And for a while, for a little bit, it's nice because obviously you're creating something that was consistent and it wasn't very heavily done, especially here in Louisiana where I'm at. The South didn't really have a very great uh, coverage threshold for rugby. Sure. But then after a while, it comes to what you say. I, at some point, you're just kind of repeating the same thing. And I think it started getting to a point where I didn't even have to look at the games anymore. I basically was just writing what I figured was going to happen and then... <laughs> I I was just like, let me look at the score. All right, that was close enough. Boom. And it was was like that. And it was just like, yo, there there has to be more. And obviously, within sports, what we see on the field or what we see in the court or, you know, within the game rules is one dynamic. But then you get the story of the players. Then you get, like, the, the impact of what the fan engagement is. And then from there... You know, you get the the business side, and right. I, that that's where my bread and butter has always been. Like, yo, wh- why are they making money? Like, how is it they're they're making their money back in so many ways? And you add to that with what we see every time a player gets a contract, or we look at you know whenever um, we we talk, even if it's just negotiations from the the fan side, it always comes off like, oh man, the player's getting screwed. You know, this is this is the ultimate, like, yo, this need to pay him whatever he's asking or we're overpaying him and it does no concept or we see this huge number or whatever and it's just like, okay, that's it. <laughs> but then you look and you're like, well, guys, do you not, do you not like, see what's happening on this other side? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this stuff costs money. You know, money goes to other places. But it's like, how are they getting it? It's not just coming off of a tree as much as we'd like it to. I would like it. <laughs> but yeah no exactly it's i mean yeah and, and i guess a lot of that too is and it's probably less in rugby at least in america for sure but i mean you look at the billionaire owners of teams it's like yeah they can be easily vilified but these are still businesses and generally aren't the businesses making these men mostly men and some women right. uh, billionaires you know so yeah it's a it's a weird it's yeah it's a whole thing <laughs> So, so let me before we kind of go dive deep. I want to I want to jump into your origin stories. All right, this is this is your superhero story a little bit more. So you you said obviously in college, <laughs> you take it, you take it. Take I'll take it, but I am no superhero. <laughs> you know, uh, so you said in college you went from wanting to do sport, doing sports, and moving into the business area. Now. A lot of people would go, okay, there was, you could have maybe just gone into general journalism and wanted to kind of take an overall look. For you, has there always been a a sided interest towards business or did something kind of spark it that direction or what happened for you? Uh, (laughs) Well, so business was until after college. The the basketball coverage was my senior year. So that was kind of like I'm launching into the world. But during college, I completely switched my major from journalism, which was just basic journalism, to right. political science. <laughs> so I've only known that for engineers. And as a person who went from engineering to international studies, I also understand this concept that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, I don't really know. I mean, politics have always interested me too, especially now as we're in this weird toxic world of divisiveness and awfulness. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> this got very dark very quick. Yeah, no, real dark. <laughs> and it can, it can keep going darker if we want it to. Um, and so I, I did that because I was working at the State News, which is Michigan State's newspaper, which is a full-time job for a college right. student. You're doing, you're, it's the, the highest paid, or it was at the time, highest paid college newspaper uh, which meant I got like 200 bucks every two weeks. <laughs> hey, look, man, you know what? As, as a college student, that is life right there. Exactly. Uh, so that was great. But I was learning everything there in this 40 hour plus a week job while trying to do school. Uh, in real time, as journalism, this was 2008 to 2012. So that's like when Twitter's taken off and becoming this real news. Like, that's Facebook really when. I was going to say Facebook had just gone off from college only to now. Right. So that's kicking. when media is starting to turn into the real tech thing that it is now and probably is the large reason why the politic world sucks now. <laughs> well, it's always sucked. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just get off that subject. <laughs> but anyway, so the journalism. This is the pleasure of the podcast. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. All right? The journalism industry was changing, and so I knew that. And the journalism professors were mostly retired journalists from right. before this shift. And so I'm like, okay, I'm learning things that, and they're teaching me how to be a journalist in the 90s. I mean, that doesn't right. make sense. So I go to political science, which I'm not doing anything with now. Uh, but after I cover basketball and see that, like, yeah, I love telling player stories. The actual gaming stories are pretty, yeah, templates. It's very uh, mundane after a hot minute. Yeah, and so then I, I go off and I get a job out of, out of school at the Grand Rapids Business Journal. And just because it was a job, and then I turned in and actually liked writing about it. And, uh <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and then my editor was great because I mean, yeah, I was mostly covering like commercial real estate, which is right. fascinating. Uh, but also in Grand Rapids, Michigan, there's a great beer scene. And well, that's a, that's business, you know? So then I start covering the business of Grand Rapids beer. Right. And, and there we go. <laughs> oh. I mean, look, but that's that's real. Like that's why I say, like there, there's always there's always got to be something that sparks it in some way, shape, or form. Obviously, but for you, it's not just not just a factor of the random happenstance of getting this job that it was just like, yo, I need some money. But something that's internally sparking, where it's like, yo, I there's something that kept rolling on from there. So for you, when it came to the Business Journal initially, initially, I'm assuming you're getting to talk with owners, especially when you're talking about commercial real estate, you're yeah. dealing with real estate buyers, you're, you're, you're talking a little bit more so with uh, uh, developers, et cetera, like that. Mm -hmm. Were you starting to, was it starting to give you, not, maybe not to say give you a mindset, but was there a certain change that you were getting in the way that ownership works versus what you maybe may have believed prior to? Oh yeah. But it also made me want more money. <laughs> that also helps things. It's like, yo, see all these guys. Yeah, they're kind of rich. You know, I kind of like these things a little bit, right? <laughs> they're able to do a lot more things that make them money, too. <laughs> That's weird how that works. More money gives you more ability to make more money. Man. <laughs> it's, crazy how the, it's crazy how the, the ball rolls, right? Yeah. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Revenue streams to for more revenue streams huh. that create <laughs> more revenue streams and get to do whatever I want. Yeah. There might be some benefits. There might be yeah. some benefits. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, no, I just, I've always been a very curious person, and I like money. I wish yeah. I had more of it. Uh, so I like talking to people who have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, is, so whenever you started going into the beer world, and I'm going to ask you another question right before this, but entering into the beer world, going from commercial real estate to the brewery world, what yeah. was the biggest significant change that you saw within that, between those? Well, it's interesting. So there's a very large brewery in Grand Rapids called Founders Brewing Company. Um, and it's, it started off small and started off the same way all, a lot of the other breweries have. But right. it, now they're huge. Now it's you know a multi-million dollar a year business and one of the biggest breweries in the country and whatever. But it started the same way as all the other ones have started, which is mostly people saying, I don't like my job, but I like making beer in my garage. So I'm going to start a business. 
And that, that is versus, the starter package? True yeah, story. versus real estate, which was – I mean, I don't need – I still don't really know how you, a lot of these guys ended up in the real estate development and stuff, you know? Like, that's not like, oh, I don't like my job. I'm going to go develop this office tower, <laughs> you know? You know, I don't like my job. So, I'm about to invest hundreds and millions – hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars in uh, properties and find them. And do the work. I don't even know where we're like, right. do I need to get my job back? Could you start this again? <laughs> where most of the guys in beer are just laid back dudes who like to, I think, like, I feel bad, you know, and, <laughs> but uh, most industries are dominated by men and there are very few women owners of breweries. But so mostly it's laid back dudes who just like making beer in their garage. Right. Just like versus, yeah, these cutthroat deal makers who are, you know, kicking people out of their houses to build a tower, you know? So I don't know. It was a very, and it's a very welcoming uh, community, though it's come under uh, a lot of scrutiny lately because of the sexism and, and racism that right. kind of undertones in that, in, in those industries. But, but I mean, that's generally just... I've only had, but again, I'm a white male. So. <laughs> <laughs> and look, it's, it's, but you know what the interesting thing is whenever you're talking within, in that, I do wonder if a lot of time it, what we now get to see is maybe not this glass ceiling breaking as much as it is just like we we now recognize more of those female brewers and right. see these more more uh culturally diverse variations of brewers because I, I would feel like most times it's it's the comfort in the in in the bars who purchase from them. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think yeah, and we have certainly seen a lot more women and minorities getting into the beer beer world. So I'm sure it's, it is just a matter. I think it's just like anything else. Like you can't sometimes you need force that. change too right. fast, you know, as, as much as it sucks to say, but some things just happen naturally and have to kind of take its time, which sucks, but you know, Nipsey hustle. <laughs> it's a yeah. marathon. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, but no, no, that's real though. Like I, I think sometimes it's it's just that shaking of needing to shake it right. to kind of be awake and then be like, okay, now we're kicking. That's like to be honest with you, it's one of the reasons why, as sucky as the situation is with COVID, like by all accounts, as sucky as it is, I think it allows for it allowed us to be able to get this transition that was so badly needing to happen. And may have happened maybe over the course of maybe 10, 15 sure. years, very incrementally. But I think having everything kind of slammed in at the same time, it forces this like re engine. It's almost like retuning for, I guess, the next decade. Re yeah, no. In, you know? So, I don't know. I, I, I like what we're going we, we're gonna to see. And I'm hoping that the consistencies that we are starting to pick up on now maintain themselves moving forward and don't just die out. But I think we will we'll, we'll see a lot of those changes. And even to that factor, though, in the fact that you were looking at watching these brewer guys, like how deep into it did you get with these guys? Because a lot of what that happens actually will lead into what my next question is. But how deep in it did you get with the guys and get to understand what they did, how they worked, how they functioned, how they thought? I mean, I got real deep. I worked part time at a brewery for a while and, and ended up, you know, helping brew and helping do just about everything because it was a small business. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing that, you know, at night while I was writing during the day. Uh, and I mean, I got into it. I went to festivals. I went to everything. I got I'm, I'm to the point now where I'm I'm almost beard out and I just kind of <laughs> go for the easy drinking light lagers again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a seasonal drinker for sure uh you know and you don't have winter out here in las vegas so i'm mostly drinking stouts when i go home for the holidays but uh you know i, I drink with the seasons but i mean i got so deep into it that i'm like i don't know you know i i was there i was in the back of the places I, yeah i can tell you pretty much how breweries work Right down All right, to perfect. <laughs> so, so this is going to lead into the, the perfect question because usually I don't try to hold it back, but I, I like where this is already going. So oh boy. <laughs> let's go. Let's be ready. <laughs> um, so look, you know, in rugby, we obviously the culture of rugby is very based, has a very heavy beer basis on mm -hmm. it. Very heavy beer basis. 
And a lot of times whenever we're dealing with clubs from an individual aspect, you know, clubs are always trying to find ways of understanding how to be able to deal sponsorships, how to get support from these companies that would likely have similar, uh, um, similar characteristics, similar goals, similar interests, I guess, sure. uh, between them. For you, now under, having had, especially within this brewery in, industry, and we'll get to sports business side a little bit later, but especially within this, this, beer, this beverage, beer and beverage industry, um, what were some of the things that you guys would look for when it came to distribution for maybe like, not, maybe not distribution of the beer, but like distribution of, of advertising. So utilizing sports and sports and we can even use, like I said, use rugby as that one. What would make it more interesting for them to utilize a club like that? That's it. I mean, so what's interesting now is, is, I mean, one, I think rugby just needs to grow in America and, and then you get this natural, the natural connection there of that beer community. Right. <laughs> of like these guys like beer. These women like beer. These people like beer. <laughs> Let's advertise our beer to them, you know? Right. Uh, so I think that's the natural connection. But so um, the brewery I worked at, it was Mitten Brewing Company, a uh, great little brewery in Grand Rapids. And now they've got a couple other tap rooms in Michigan. But uh, it was called Mitten. It was kind of like a double entendre. The, the you know Michigan is shaped like a, a mitten. Mitten, right? right. <laughs> uh, little little thing, little thing. Yeah. Actually, you know what? They have a, a battle of the mittens uh, game between Michigan State and Michigan rugby that they do every year. Ah. The only reason why the mittens concept came in, and I'm an Iowa guy too. I was I was raised in Iowa. Still didn't reckon it. I forgot completely. Forgot about the mittens concept until they had presented that. In, that's in, that's pretty cool uh <laughs> but then the two owners also really like baseball so it ended up being a detroit tigers themed uh brewery nice so the tap rooms all tigers blah 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 uh and so like i mean as a small business you don't have a ton of money to, right. to go shelling out to sports teams especially a major league sports team but in grand rapids there's a single a baseball team called the west michigan whitecaps which actually I'm wearing their hat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, give yeah. me the proper, proper dude. <laughs> yeah. All right, exactly. Uh, and um, so we ended up starting conversations with them, and and they are still. I mean, I'm I haven't worked there in five, maybe six years. I don't even remember the last time I worked there, but uh, and they're still a, a partner of the West Michigan Whitecaps uh, because they've just got this natural baseball thing, but also. What goes perfectly for the baseball game? Of course. As long as there's fans at games, which there won't be tonight, which is opening day, which I don't know when this podcast airs, but I'm going to say that anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I'm normally work. careful about work. dates and what, what not, but uh, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, beer and baseball, beer and sports really in the crowds is perfect. So right. that was a natural fit for them. Um, and, but I mean, beer is one of the largest sponsorship segments in in uh sports so yeah i would suggest rugby teams just go talk to their local brewery which there almost certainly is now no matter where you go <laughs> true story hey, but then, and just but then, kind of like uh be like hey we want to foster community like we're not looking for millions of dollars hundreds of thousands of dollars right we're just looking for a nice partner who can grow with us we'll yeah. hook it up well, yeah. I guess I, I ask in terms of, of the value. So, like, you talk about with, 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 with West, Westminster with a single-A team, you know, what, what is – obviously having the fans there is one aspect, but are they a team that brings in a whole bunch of fans? Or, what, like, what's the value proposition that goes for that brewer company? Yeah, Outside I mean – just like, oh, we got fans. Everybody's got fans somewhere. Like, what, what made them interesting in their, their aspect? I think it was a, a so so then the other other thing is is they had, we had a distribution deal they still have a distribution deal with the people who do the stadium and all the beers have baseball themed names so there's a nice brown ale called Triple Crown Brown this mm -hmm. is right after Miguel Cabrera hit for the Triple Crown for the Tigers um, and so it, it was kind of like a, a way to get the beer out to a new mass audience without trying it I mean the the White Caps I mean I think they draw probably. I don't know 
at least 5,000 people a game. Right. So, I mean, and then a big logo right outside the, the entrance. So everybody would come in and see it. And I don't know. I mean, it's a, you just kind of have to pick and choose your, your battles, I guess, as a, as a brewery, <laughs> as a small brewery. And, and uh, that was the one we picked and I don't know, they're still doing it now, six, six years later. So must be doing well. It might, it might be working a little bit. Yeah, working I don't know. A bit there, you know, uh, and, and even within, so within that, so whenever you started like being able to, you, you went all the way into the brew area. All right. Yeah. And the book itself, it was just basically a history of how these, these beers are being made or what, what? Yeah. I mean, so let's see, I had been covering the beer industry in Grand Rapids for about two years mm. and out of nowhere, I get an email from a publisher, uh, a little niche publisher called the history press. <laughs> uh, and they were like, Hey, very subtle, still- by the way, very, very uh, right. subtle. <laughs> I wonder what they write about. Uh, <laughs> We will, uh, and they would just reach out and they were like, Hey, we're looking for somebody to to write a book about the history of beer in Grand Rapids. We know it's a great beer city now. Like we'd love to have you do that. And I was like, Oh, that's great. I've always wanted to write a book. What what better opportunity at a 23 year old than no, how old was I? That that's regardless. I was early (laughs) twenties. I'm not going to do math. It was less than 25, more than 18. You got somewhere in between. <laughs> right. Oh, more than 21. Uh, oh, right, 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 right. Right, right. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> um, So I was like, oh, great. I've always wanted to write a book. I have a publisher asking me to write a book. I'm going to write a book. Uh, and, and turns out, and I think now a lot of people know this, more people know this, that there's a very, very rich beer history in america that was kind of wiped out because of this little company called budweiser oh uh, you know like i've never the, heard of them right I and they should advertise more yeah uh, they should <laughs> they should probably and uh, get involved in sports a little bit more you know, maybe just... um, <laughs> so in 1977 there were like 77 breweries or 87 i don't know yeah something. less than a, fewer than 100 breweries in america right and that was after years and years of consolidation. There was in the 1880s, I don't know my numbers uh, specifically off the top of my head, but in the 18, late 1800s, there were m- more than 4,000 breweries in the U.S. Oh, snap. Right. And so I go back and Grand Rapids had this super rich brewing culture in the 1800s, including like one of the like big shots, business big shots. Yeah, uh, he was involved in everything, you know, and and actually, so was Adolphus Bush at, at uh, Budweiser. So that's a that's a whole different. I'm not going to talk that. I could talk for days about this, obviously. Uh, <laughs> oh, we got. Um, <laughs> I got to work at some point. Today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got time. All right, all right. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna mess up your all your time. No, I'm playing. <laughs> um. Anyway, so I, I go back, and it goes back to the 1800s. I write this whole thing, and 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 now. Now, finally, I think it wasn't until like 2014 or so that we passed what was the previous high of the 1800s of breweries in the country. Now we're over like 8,000. Uh, so it is just because of the fact that now we there's been a, a much easier method of being able to create independent breweries and there's a lot more legislative looseness to it, or is it a little like- bit? I mean, there's still a lot of bad laws out there for brewing and everything. Uh, those all stem from prohibition when, when it went to zero. Right. Um, but yeah. And it's a lot of the buy local buy. you know, back in the 1800s, you had to buy local. Right. Now there's the new sentiment of like buy local. It's better for the economy, the environment, the economy, everything. So. Okay. I got you. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> and also hate for global corporations, you know. <laughs> and also allows to be able to have actual variation in taste instead of being force fed the same proverbial piss water as many would like to say exactly. that gets put out. No, no. Mm-hmm. That's that's real. That's real. And is that was it from working the brewery where you decided to like you were like, all right, now I gotta understand the segmentation of how all these beers went. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 
and just cheer. I mean, I like to drink beer, so I was just curious. But <laughs> <laughs> so did Wes, dude. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's weird. I also like I also like food with a lot of butter and milk, and it's weird how that how that went. Oh. oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's almost like it was meant to be when you got to Las Vegas. It was like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's hot here, though. Yeah, that is the dry heat. Look, I'll say it's this. Dry, the dry it's a dry heat. heat. Say what? <laughs> it's a dry heat. It's still hot. <laughs> I was going to say, look, I was going to say, look, as living in one of the swampy, humid, hills of heat, I, I will take my dry heat. Now, mind you. I do like the fact that my water still stays with me, even if it gets magnified to kill me, but it still stays versus the dry heat where it just kind of evaporates and it's I mean, just releasing out of you. As I mentioned before we started recording, I have to take my dog for a walk at 5.30 in the morning because otherwise the sun gets high, bakes the cement, and then my burns my doggy's feet. Also, I can't be outside in 110 degree heat. Oh, the poor guy. In the sun. In the I could, I could, it's not bad. It's dry heat, so it's not bad out in the shade. Right. Like That's why I said shade at least helps. Like, you actually benefit from covering. It's not just... Yeah, but when the wind blows, it's like a, oh. it's like a dryer. Or like an air dryer. Mm. It's like a <sighs> blow dryer. That's what I'm, that's <laughs> the word I'm looking for. All right. So, Okay. So this is where I wanted to really bring you on, especially when it, because of the fact of the sports business aspect of it yeah. and really be able to tap into this. So over the last, over, you, well, you, you said you've been working, you became full-time last year, right? But you've been last, working, yeah. Yeah. last August and started freelancing. Uh, as I said, I was mostly freelancing about food and beverage, but I, I, you know, my girlfriend who works for uh, the Vegas Golden Knights out mm-hmm. here in Las Vegas, the whole reason I'm in Las Vegas, um, she was like, hey, these guys at Front Office Sports are doing some cool things. Like, you should reach out and see if you can write for them. I was like, yeah, that's great. So then I started writing for them. And as they've continued to grow, eventually they were like, hey, do you want to come on full time? I was like, yeah, you guys are growing. You guys are awesome. I love this. I like writing about sports business. And so here we are a year later after going full time and we're chugging along. Yo. And, and look, and it says a lot. Because I, I, like I said, I've been reading Front Office Sports for – the better part of the last two, three years at least. Um, but, uh, or two years? Two years? Something like that. Whatever they, around when they first started. But anyways, you dropped a lot of articles when it comes to the ever-developing changes that have happened over the course of just 12 months, just yeah. alone in, in that. For you, whenever you're seeing what is happening in sports right now, what is one of the major I don't want to say major changes, but what is one of the newest, what it seems like the newest benefactors for most sports, my, major or minor? Because uh, I've also seen you, you've talked a lot about a lot of, of the minor side sports as well. Yeah. Um, what is one of the biggest changes that's helped, started to help their revenue generation that you've started to see um, as you've done more and more research? Well, I think, and this is kind of, Wait, I'm not even in that topic, I don't think, but it, it's fresh in my mind because I'm writing about it. I actually had like five interviews this morning about it. Um, is so, and I'm sure you've read a lot of these. Is in the last year, we've written quite a bit about kind of the tech evolution of of fan engagement within the stadium, right? And COVID has essentially accelerated that of saying, uh, so one of the interviews I had today was said pre-COVID, he, they do a lot in Europe. So they've, they've got these stats already because Europe handled themselves a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> uh, the adoption rate of mobile apps within to use for you know information in stadium, contactless payment, uh, paperless tickets, whatever, was about 20%. Right. He said now that fans are starting to go back and, and uh, he used Sweden for, for the example, it's like 80 to 90% now. Wow. Because nobody wants to touch anybody. Nobody wants to touch anything. Nobody wants to be fumbling with cash. And he's like, so it's, it's the adoption rates there, but it's also, and he's like, yes, I'm a tech you know, person, but he's like, 
it's also quicker. You, you end up spending less time in line because you're not fumbling with cash, not fumbling with the card. You can just go, bloop, whatever. You can order ahead of time. You can, you don't have to look for the cheapest beer. You can find that on your app. You can, you know, all these other things. I'm like, that's actually kind of interesting. This was already a trend. Right. Uh, and here it is. And then another thing that happened in that is, is we've been talking a lot about, and actually I've had a couple, I had kind of conflicting comments in this, but one was an older person who he said, he's like, it's going to be a long time before I'm able to go back to a state. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So he's like, I want this to happen. But another guy was like, uh, you know, we've heard so much about the at-home experience, the AR, the VR, like let's concentrate on this. And he's like, right. if anything, we've seen in the pandemic that people don't want to stay at home. <laughs> It's like if you're prevented from going, like I would give anything to be at a Yankees game tonight. Because, but it's basically because you're not allowed to, not so much. I don't know. Is it, or is it like, would, I don't know. But I mean, if we had the option, would I rather go to a Vegas Golden Knights game or just watch it on a headset and sitting on my couch? Right. True, 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 true. You want the experience, the real experience is is going to supersede it. Yeah, I don't know. So there's these weird trends that we've been talking about that are kind of like being accelerated, but then also make you question of like, all right, we've seen now in the last four months that maybe people don't want to spend all their time at home because they were forced to spend all their time at home. Like, yeah, we worked it all out. That was our year's worth of spending time at home. It was supposed to go across 40, 12 months. No, no, we, we, we went through one quarter. We're good. Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sitting at home and watching Netflix all day sounds great, but when you're actually tasked to do that, it's a lot harder than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Tiger King's on, in which case, sit there all day. <laughs> Sip it on. Good to go. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So that's, a, that's a whole... So that was kind of my... Yeah, I mean, that's not a real answer to your question, but that's kind of what I was noodling on today, so that's what I answered. <laughs> but no. <laughs> it's my answer, and I choose it. Yeah, that's the one I chose to go you with. You take it. No, no, but no, no. But it, it still actually stands to one of the reasons, because, look, one of the it, – it's one thing, especially looking at it from a minor and major sport position, is understanding what each one is doing. and exp- When you get into fan engagement concept, I get it from a major sports where it's easier to say, hey, let's maybe lean more on being able to take advantage of the people being at home or at the bars versus what happens for minor league sports where you're not necessarily getting those TV deals. You're not necessarily right. getting that. So the fan engagement uh, uh, there plays in. And I kind of wrap it in back again with rugby while we have the MLR. And were you able to in experience any of that? MLR Las Vegas weekend, or did you just kind of write it? Okay. I, yeah, no, I went out. I, I mean, rugby is, and so, so I, uh, I'm working on a project with, with Blaine Scully, the cat, former captain of the US. It's my guy. I had him on the podcast not too long ago. Heck yeah. I love, I love Blaine. Obviously I'm working on a project with him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I but, hated him, but we decided to work together. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, and uh, so I've, I've kind of stumbled into rugby, as you can tell of mm-hmm. like, you know, I've always That's thought it was normally do. Nobody, yeah, nobody I've always thought it was. <laughs> I've always thought it was interesting. I remember in high school, my family went to to Ireland, and I remember sitting in a hotel room with my my brother, and it was on TV, and we we're like, "Ah, this is awesome! <laughs> we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Just a bunch of guys running at each other and throwing a ball backwards." <laughs> uh, and so then, like now that I started writing about sports business, I was like, "Okay, like this is a." Kind of a, I mean, it's a cool sport. It's huge in other countries, not big here yet, but there's these leagues that keep trying to start here, and this is cool. And then I get connected with Blaine, and so I've kind of just, yeah, stumbled into it. I still don't fully understand the rules. Okay, again, <laughs> actually, you know, like but who really fully understand? Who fully understands the rules of like baseball? You nobody, know? nobody. Look, are Unless you entertained? A, this is right. all we need. Are you entertained? We're good. You'll get the right. rules over time. <laughs> right. Football? I don't know. Is that a face mask? I don't know. <laughs> Actually, that's a face mask is a really bad example because that's clear. It's they didn't grab the face mask. 
<laughs> when is it not illegal? When is it not illegal? When is it not illegal to just be able to pull down the mask a little bit? Like I thought that was just part of the chaos of it. See, <laughs> it's like yo, I'm just yeah. trying to. We're trying to amp it up. Like what's right. for the game? All right. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I I love it because it's a fun sport to watch. It seems right. weirdly dangerous, but whatever. Yeah. But no, no. But so from from that engagement with the, and the MLR stuff, like what was some of the things? That you and obviously you're doing this project with Blaine. Thanks for the breaking on that. We put all the eyes on it now. But no, oh, no. Oh yeah, maybe project. I don't know if I was supposed to say that. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Break it all that. No, I'm Blaine. Um, but no, being able to work, see this thing hands on, and kind of seeing what they're developing in comparison to what you've seen with these other sports, minor and major. Are you seeing a lot of the tick marks that would? kind of denotes that they're in the right direction i think so and i think they're they're taking a lot of i mean i know they are because they said as much uh and they have a lot of the same people but that they're taking the same notes from you know the mls right and i don't think rugby will necessarily ever be at the point that soccer is in the u.s and, and you look at mls and it's still not what it probably should be right. um in terms of popularity uh but i think so i mean it's they're doing a lot at the grassroots level which i think is the biggest thing right now is is making sure there's the fans <laughs> the future <Always> fans <laughs> you know Always i think that's one of the, the things that's scary about baseball is if i feel like i mean i know some major league teams are, are certainly investing in it but it seems like youth baseball is kind of dropping off by the wayside um and so that I think kind of is scary. I just wrote a story about, well, it was a newsletter segment about kind of the valuations of, of MLB teams possibly dropping by up to 20% in the next year, mostly because of, of the coronavirus, but it was also suggesting like the labor issues, but then also the future pipeline of talent. Like, yeah. How long is baseball going to be based? I mean, people have been talking about the death of baseball for decades now at this point, but um I mean, is it always going to be this popular sport? There's already stadiums that are empty a lot of the times. Right. You know? I'm, but see, and that's, you know, whenever you, you, you talk about like where rugby can it be at a certain level. I mean, for me, I've always, and I'm, I'm always obviously going to be biased. I've, I've never believed that it's going to ever get to a point where it's like football or anything like that. I think no. football has such an ingrained, just dynamic difference from every other sport right. in the country. So it's not even worth looking at that. And even basketball, to an extent, has the ingrained nature to it just because of the ease of play and uh, the, the low standard required to play on a casual level. And I wouldn't be surprised if basketball surpasses football before too long. I mean, it has certainly, I think, globally. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But that's the thing. I, I don't know if, it, if the, the, the setup of the sport of basketball – like, yeah, I mean, the season's too, like, I, it, like there isn't the singular eyeballs on a Sunday thing right. to do it. But I think as a general, I don't know, that's a good question. Huh. So, so. There's uh, lots so, to think about. So, right, right. <laughs> I'm going to get lost here. <laughs> <laughs> so to kind of, kind of make, finish my point, you know, I, I've always looked at where uh, rugby can be in terms of, in comparison to MLS and in comparison to hockey hockey mm. in the u.s not hockey in canada because that's, that's, yeah, that's it. you know but hockey in the u.s and mls and my theory has always been well mls has been able to make a rise simply because of the fact that we it's had the longevity over 30 40 years of being able to put well, 30 35 years of being able to put time into it and develop underneath plus influx of being able to have internationals come and of course, everybody has – so many people have the nostalgia of playing soccer as a kid. Right. So there's that, that element in this generation, this, uh, this post-1992 on, have a much stronger dynamic to different alternative sports. Um, I still don't think that it resonates with the culture of the U.S. fully in no, terms of, like, the, the natural aggressiveness of the culture. We're a boastful nation. Like, call it what it is. We're, we're a boastful nation. So there's a certain level of loudness and crashing that has to come with it. And obviously, when it comes to hockey, I think because hockey is so expensive, 
to be able yeah. to play, right. you know, it's very difficult for it to be able to get to that next level. Uh, well, it's not that level, but to be able to, you know, it's, it's fallible it's to say the right. least. You know, so then you have rugby. You have lacrosse, but I don't think lacrosse has the international spread. No, and I think that has the same issue as hockey to an yeah. extent. Of it's pretty expensive, you know. And like so how much does a rugby ball cost? Um, it can be between ten and twenty-five dollars. If you're stupid and buy it from Dick Sporting Good, it'll be like twenty-five, thirty-five. But if you order it offline, then you can get it for probably like fifteen, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars. Right. Okay. Well, see, there you go. That's your. That's there your you go. Sense. And that's where I was like, <laughs> <laughs> where I, Man, you know, you sold all this <laughs> well, that's why, I mean, that's why soccer is so big too, is you kick a milk jug and you're good. Boom. Exactly. It won't, it won't go this. It doesn't have the same flight path as a, a sphere, but. <laughs> hey, look, look, as long as it gets from point A to somewhat where point B was supposed to be, it's a play. It works. It works. Right. But yeah, so, but the thing that is kind of stands out becomes how rugby ends up promoting itself. Yeah. And, and I'm going to kind of let us wrap it up so I don't take up too much of your time because I know it's yes. almost been an hour. Um, but the way that rugby kind of wraps up towards the end is how it promotes itself. I, I found that it really always promotes itself very humbly, which I don't think that necessarily works well within a, a U.S. culture. I think, again, yeah. I think we, look, we look at our be- what do we consider our best stars? The ones that are usually the loudest speaking, or at least the most the most enigmatic in some way, shape, right. or form. You know, uh, within rugby, there hasn't really been that. In the U.S., we have those characters, but not promoted very right. well. And so that's why I go back and ask, you know, for you, from what you've seen with other sports, in doing these articles, in being able to see what has been kind of an underlying, maybe, maybe not what you've obviously written, what people will see right at the surface, but kind of what you kind of see underneath as a trending pattern, whether it's from an MLR stance or whether it's from individual grassroots club stance. Like, yeah. what is it that you look at that you've seen all these other teams, all these other sports, all these other leagues kind of do on the low that you think that rugby really should benefit from or it should be able to – should do? And obviously, you've seen MLR, so – you're seeing them work at a commerce level at a certain point. Uh, I mean, I think to your point, I think being a little bit more boastful about the experience, but also, I mean, one, it is building that grassroots level and and making sure your fans there in the future. But, uh, you know, I've heard multiple times and saw a little bit of it, of the great like tailgating kind of fan atmosphere sort of thing. And I think that's something to play up and to push forward. Because when you look at, I mean, and I know we've kind of just knocked hockey for being an expensive sport, uh, but, you know, hockey is now my favorite sport. One, because my girlfriend is, of nine years has worked in it and loves it and everything, but. It always gets you. Look, look, let's not lie. Our girlfriends will get us into our into the places where you never realize and you're like, well, uh, exactly. all right, I guess I kind of like this. <laughs> <laughs> but. The Golden Knights, which were when the franchise was launched, was were widely, widely expected to be like who can? Who, I mean, I remember they they had the first year when they went to the Stanley Cup, there was a hype video of people saying like, hockey in the desert, like that's gonna fail, like whatever, right. blah blah. Those games are some of the best events I've ever been to because of how lively they are, the in-game experience, the atmosphere outside the arena just everybody who's bought into that team for some reason. You know, I mean, the Vegas born is a slogan because it's, they were expanded here, but we've never had a pro sport. I say we, I moved here for the team. So I was like, right. right. <laughs> but <laughs> the city never had a pro team. So they fully embraced it. They've made it this community, this, you, everywhere you go, they've got bumper stickers everywhere, everywhere. Every car has a bumper sticker. It's crazy, but it's a community. It's this thing. Um, and the game day experience is incredible. It's unlike almost any other sporting okay. event I've ever been to. Right. Um, and I think if if rugby kind of leans on that and says, like, our games, no matter who's playing, are going to be just absolutely incredible experiences as a fan, even if you're not watching what's on the field. Because that's what happened here with hockey is, who I mean, yeah, where there were a lot of transplants who had NHL teams, 
but a lot of people here didn't know that single thing about hockey. Right. So there were a lot of, the, there still are a lot of these uh, learn to play programs that the team puts on. So these, the, an adult, like kind of like, just like teaching the basic fundamentals of this sport so that when people watch it, they know what's going on. And I know there's some major league rugby teams doing that, but um, even if you're not watching the hockey game, you're still having one of the best nights you could have in a city full of entertainment options. Right. In non COVID times, you could do whatever you want. Right. You know? So I think if, if MLR teams and, and rugby teams in general, just lean on it and say, Hey, you come here, you're going to have a family barbecue atmosphere and with, you know, 5,000 of your best friends. That's awesome. You know? No, that's, that's actually really real. That's really real. And I, I like that because I, I did, I remember two years ago, whenever the golden Knights ended up winning the championship, right? They, they did win or they, they didn't got, win. They lost. They lost. Right. They got they lost in the finals. Was incredible up until Oh that my point. God. It was, yeah. I mean, you, an expansion team going to the Stanley Cup final. That's crazy. Right. And that was in their, in their second year. Of that was the, in their first year. That was their first. Yeah. So I just remember specifically that they had had a different intro every single game. Yeah. Every single home game. And being able to do that and just be able to, the, I, I guess, the virality of it on YouTube stood out. Right. And it made it, them even stand out a little bit. Just a tad bit. You know, just yeah. a tad bit. Um, but, you know, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Tell me, let me ask you this, and I'm going to leave you on this one. What was your best fan experience in sports as a journalist? Because hmm. you come in with a much more critical eye than you do as a casual fan. So you got to be impre- a lot more impressed in that element. So, I mean, I feel like it's cheating saying Stanley Cup final game one of the Vegas Golden Knights. That's probably cheating. Because that was insane. Having so, so one of the big reasons this team really got the community behind it was, it was right after the their their first season started like five days right after that shooting here. Right. Um. And so. Oh, wow. The so the fact that this is our first pro team that the everything and I had moved here a month before that. My girlfriend had moved out at the beginning of the summer to help ready the launch. I had to quit my job and do all the, like putting my things in order. <laughs> <laughs> get, get that set up ready, you know? And, and so then I moved out here and then a month later, the shooting happens. And then five days later, this team launches one of the defensemen who's kind of a default Vegas local. He had played for one of the minor league teams here and lived here in the off seasons. Uh, gives us just awesome speech that just was incredible. And then this team goes on this incredible winning streak. Right. And then they make the playoffs, which that wasn't supposed to happen. Then they make it the Stanley Cup final. That wasn't supposed to happen. So going to game one of that, of this team that just has had one of the most incredible sports stories of all time, arguably, um, that was incredible. My favorite, I think, as a member, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking this is a hard question. Yo, I literally saw the thought bubbles actually start to pop up in your head. Uh, (laughs) You know, because I've gone to a lot of great Michigan State games. um, But I think it might be the second Cubs game I ever went to. I'm a Cubs fan because growing up in West Michigan, uh, you, you basically had the choice of being a Tigers fan or a Cubs fan. Or was it, was it your hatred somewhere. of Detroit or your – No, I love Detroit. Uh, but the Tigers, when I was growing up, were terrible. True story. And the Cubs, while they were terrible – Were on uh, the come up. Yeah, I mean, like the year I really started liking sports was 1998. Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire. Okay. Uh, well, if we're going to go with the time whenever the, the home run record is just getting popped up for no reason. Right. <laughs> uh, so the second Cubs game I ever went to was the first game I saw Sammy Sosa hit a home run. No. And, that, and so that, I was like, that's it. Yeah, I locked it out. <laughs> and just the uh, talk about kind of community fan neighborhood experience, like R- Wrigley Field is incredible. The history there, the at like the, the ambiance of the small um, uh, concourse, the, 
just the ivy, the everything about that place is magical. And uh, to see, you know, my favorite player growing up hit his hit a home run for the first time in person. That was that was cool. Bro, I can imagine. Like that's that's. I feel like that's like nostalgia crack all in yeah. in one. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't even remember that memory until you're like, "What's your favorite experience?" At you know. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, you really gave the space for the bubble over there. I'm seeing it. <laughs> yeah, it happens. That's why I, normally if I have like interviews that, you know, because now everybody has decided this isn't a shot at you at all. <laughs> but, oh, <my> God. <laughs> no, but everybody's decided interviews on, on Zoom are, are the way to go. And I'm like, hold on. Can we go back to like four months ago? Like podcasts are different, I think. Um, because normally you would be in person, you'd see so right. cross country. This would make sense, but if I'm doing like a ten minute interview that a PR person sets up, I hope PR people don't. They're gonna kill me now. <laughs> but let's go back to four and a half months ago when I could just call somebody, right? To, uh, do this whole thing. Wait, do what? Do the Zoom. Oh yeah, yeah. With you, I'll do this all the time. Yeah, yeah, but again, pretty, podcast, yeah. but, no, no, but I get, I get what you're saying. Like it, 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 it changes. It changes the way that even, even the dynamic. Look, even for me, like the dynamic of being able to obviously you know the dynamic of being in person is not just a factor of you know just being able to see the person, being able to talk, but it's a, it's a body language. It's, it's the energy in the room. It's the right. you know really being able to mimic the movement. It, it is, you get a strong substitution, and of course, when it comes to ease of going across the country, it's easier than trying to get a plane ticket and be right. like, hey, yo, can you come through for, you know, 10, 15, or, you know, even if you're doing it on the phone, you don't get the, obviously, the same dynamic of being able to right. look at somebody in their eyes, proverbially, but um, it's, it's weird, I, though, I agree with you. I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the way in terms of a natural one but i think that now that it's an option i think people will be less reluctant to utilize it versus i don't know because i always prefer to do interviews in person yeah but i'd also rather do a a, like a 10 minute quick interview about you know this new ticket program or whatever over the phone versus a a video interview a zoom right yeah whenever it comes to something that awkward you know Eh. yeah i i can get that like because it does not like you don't need the eye to eye contact to be like, yo, I just, you're essentially asking for facts. It's not right. asking for necessarily the depth. It's asking for facts. You want, you want eye to eye contact. You want depth. You're like, yeah. Oh, I want to be able to go through, but yeah, wait, wait, people are making you have to do zooms for 10 minute conversations. Yeah. Oh God. Yo, that's like, like, exhausting. I'm not going to lie. So then, <laughs> right. So if I've got a day like today where I had like 10 interviews, and I didn't put a shirt on. I mean, I have a shirt on, but not like a collared shirt, which is normally what I would put on to go to a real person interview. You got to go to a professional. That's the whole thing. <laughs> look, look, look. I, I love you, PR people, but. <laughs> oh, bro, I, I'm not going to lie. I, 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 I do get to, it's Whenever you know you're going to get the canned answers, it just it just drives me. You, I can just watch my energy just die with every response. It's like, ah, come on, guys. I just can you break out just a little bit. Next like, time I come on, before. next time I come on, I'm only bringing canned answers <laughs> <laughs> and just answering questions with canned answers that are wrong to that question. But it has nothing to do with the question whatsoever. It's Actually, just like. <laughs> Let's plan that for April first. Let's do. I'm that. here for this. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, we're gonna do it completely over phone. We're not even just gonna use Zoom. We're gonna use Zoom and the phone. So we're not even using the speakers right. for. <laughs> Great. <laughs> just call I like them. It. Just look at it. <laughs> no. I love it. I'm into it. Pat, man, dude, I appreciate this in a big way, man. This was this is legitimately fun. This no, it was le- fun. I'm I'm glad. I'm glad we were able to do this, and I can't wait to come back. <laughs> oh, you will be back. Oh, we were gonna be. T- Look, I'm still. I still didn't feel like we touched enough on this beer life, and I really need to go into it. For- and I feel like we talked mostly about beer, which I'm like, I'm supposed to be talking about rugby. So I had this whole booklet of rugby stuff ready to go, and 
then when you ask Ruby questions, I just talk about other things. So, you know, you know, it's 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 okay. You know, we we who needs to keep formalities? All right, I want you to know that when you do your research, you have completely wasted your time. You do it free off the mind. Act, answer questions you have no idea what the answer is. Just go. <laughs> yep. I'm, except next time I'm bringing cane quest, cane answers. <laughs> Batman, dude, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, look, I I'm here for this energy life, man. Like, I hope you guys really enjoyed this one. Yo, thank you for Pat to Pat for coming through and uh, uh, just laying down some uh, 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 ideas and thoughts and definitely more knowledge on beer than I would have actually imagined. Um, on top of that, guys, thank you for taking the time to listen. Uh, really appreciate it every time. Please go ahead and take a look back at some of our other past interviews. We just had Kelly Smith from American uh, Rugby Pro Training Center. We had Adam uh, Gray Howard Hayward uh, from the movie Play On. Uh, we had my guy James Brunson on from the North Philly Nomads. And we've had just a list of guests from... Nia Tapper, Chetta Ember, Kyle Tiana Granby, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and just a load of people who have come through. Blaine Scully, Phil Thiel, we've had Farrah, uh, uh, <laughs> Farrah Douglas. Just a just a bunch of people coming through. And we got so much more. There is so much great rugby stories and opportunities being presented. And I hope you guys are enjoying it. It is something to just take in. Please check us out on our YouTube page. Uh, YouTube.com slash Gift Time Rugby Network. And otherwise, I hope that you guys stay happy. I hope you guys are staying healthy. And hope you guys know that you are highly favored. You guys have a great one. I'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Oh, yeah.